Welcome back to Sacred Arts Academy, where we talk about all things from the sacred to the practical. I'm very excited for our topic today, as well as our guest, Carolina Gutierrez. She is a business unicorn, founder, serial entrepreneur, mental health advocate, podcast host, and counselor. Every step she takes in life is led by intuition. Formally educated in social work, the healing journey is a way of life for her. She is fluent in business and feelings and shines her brightest when speaking to the spirit of both. Her intuitive business uh, strategy helps purpose-driven business owners get things done. Authentic and conscious connection combined with grounded action describes her style. Welcome, Carolina. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Thank you so much. Um, before we got started, I had mentioned that I noticed that your domain is curandera.ca. Can you tell me a little bit about what curanderismo is and how you got started in that path? I think that for different people, there's a different definition a bit. Like I think it, it might vary a bit. But for me, ultimately, um, curanderismo is a beautiful tradition that has developed from um, the indigenous and native practices that are found in Latin America, but that were also brought over by the transatlantic slave trade because they brought their own indigenous practices that kind of mixed in. And I think depending on what part of the region you come from, you're going to get an interesting mix there with that. Um, also combining the other forms of immigration that came to the region or those that came, um, you know, conquering as well. Right. So it is a very interesting mix. And ultimately, I think that a curandera, um, curar is the root of that word, which is to heal. So there's always a healing component to any of the work that um, curanderas or curanderos do. Um, but ultimately, I think it's we are spirit intermediaries for our communities. And because there's a very firm belief that any disbalance, any illness, any issue that arises in your life starts first on the spiritual plane and then kind of comes transferred, it starts to transfer over. And so um, you have someone that kind of straddles those two worlds to be able to bring some of those messages or healings, because not all curanderas are mediums. I'm a medium, but not all of them are, not all of them do readings, but they all do healings. And so for me, Healing is a huge component that comes in um, to all my work that uh, that surrounds this. Mm, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much for that background. I know that um, I think I read that you have been hearing spirits since you were four years old. How did that early experience kind of shape your understanding of the world and now the path that you are on today? The funny thing is, is that for that first kind of the first half of my life, it didn't, it did and it didn't. So I didn't know what it was. I thought everybody had this experience. And I know that sounds kind of odd, but think about it as a four-year-old, even as a six, eight, 10 year old, we might not have that awareness that we clearly don't in certain areas, that kind of discernment that we have as adults. Um, and so Number one, I didn't grow up as much as I grew up in a culture that believed in this because absolutely, right? Spirits are in every kind of corner of, of being uh, being of Latin descent. Um, I didn't grow up in a family that would have encouraged it. So it was never something that I spoke about, but it was just this internal experience that very much shaped everything that I did without understanding that it was shaping it. And it wasn't until, um, and I've spoken about this a lot in on in different podcasts that I do. It wasn't until I was about in my early 20s and I had an encounter with a medium accidentally. I didn't go get a reading. She was just in a workshop that I was in um, and everyone was getting these little readings and and she comes to me and she's like, honey, you're so intuitive. You need to be doing this for a living. You're more intuitive than I am, right? And, you know, that absolutely, <laughs> like that experience absolutely changed my world. Um, and that voice that I had been hearing or voices that I had been hearing since so little, you know, and I, it assimilated into what I thought was my own internal dialogue, um, my own, the voice of my own, you know, kind of thoughts and, and, and feelings. Um, 
it turned around, you know, after that encounter that I had, and they're like, great, now you understand, let's get to work. Right. And it just, you know, flipped my life upside down because the reality is, is that this wasn't, I, I embrace my work fully and I love it, but this wasn't what I had planned. Right. <laughs> and I think a lot of people on the spiritual journey start to kind of really recognize that it sometimes it's not what we have planned, but it's what spirit has planned for us. I always find it so fascinating uh, to hear story like yours, because um when we finally get the context or a new perspective, then you really start to kind of lean into it. So kind of hearing how you thought that this was everybody else's experience, but it wasn't until it, you know, there was some light that was shined on, Oh, like, uh, you know, this is a type of mediumship or, or there is a gift here and having that context and how that changes not just your perspective, but also the trajectory of the path that you're walking, because we only know what we know, right? And and the unknown is always, can always be scary, but at the same time, it can always change the trajectory in which we carry ourselves, which is so fascinating to me. The reality is, is when you, when you listen to your gut, and I always, and I say this in my intuition development workshops and stuff, you're not going to like what you're going to hear. You know, and th that's one of the really big truths, I think, in this work that people don't prepare us for, right? Oh, listen to your guidance, follow it. But your guidance sometimes is like absolutely the polar opposite of where you want to go in life or where you think you want to go in life or what you're delusional of at the moment, right? <laughs> like, um, and so it's kind of like that crappy boyfriend that, Mm -hmm. seemed great when you first met them. And then you go through, you know, some trials and tribulations, you might leave the relationship. And then you look back and you're like, what was I on that I thought that this was okay, or that I allowed this friendship in my life, or I allowed somebody to treat me this way at work, right? So it really is. Um, it, it, it's challenging. And I think people don't we don't talk about that enough. I think we give it the impression that it's easy and you just flow. And it's like, yeah, if we were trained as a child to work that way, but you know, there's conditioning and there's um, outside influences that um, might tell us otherwise that then we have to work on kind of deprogramming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that the ego tends to step in a lot because it's trying to keep us safe. And so you have this internal battle of like, oh, like I know in my gut, this feels right, but my brain is saying something else. Right. And and I think we tend to go with the ego um, a lot more, at least in my experience from the way that I've been programmed or trained throughout my life. And, and uh, that's one of those external factors that are also that's also internal um from what i can tell absolutely because we bring those in right we bring all of those internal factors in we internalize them and they start to sound like our voice whether we identify it as ego or and sometimes it might be intermingled with kind of that wisdom that we all carry as well right so mm -hmm. um you know that's that's part of the lesson of life Yep, absolutely. You had mentioned that uh, one of the ways that you carry yourself in both business and personal is to really ground yourself in your intuition. Can you just lightly explain how do you define intuition and why do you believe it should come first in both personal and professional decision making? Well, you're talking my favorite topic here, Jesse. So <laughs> strap in, we might be here for a while. Um, so for me, intuition is um, our custom made internal GPS. It is that part of us that is connected to the divine that guides us towards our purpose always. Now we might have different team members that kind of play a role in our intuition and um, how it shows up might be very different for every individual, but we all have it. We all share that, whether it's a feeling in the, in the pit of your stomach, whether it's voices like I hear, whether it's dreams or, you know, there's a whole range where uh, of, of different areas of how, sorry, a whole range of items in which it can show up 
in that way. But ultimately, we're still talking about the same thing. And it is a unique thing that we all share. You know, we all don't necessarily become parents or we might not um, pursue post-secondary education or we might, might not all be homeowners, but we all have intuition regardless of where you are in life, whether you listen to it or not. It is a built-in system that comes in um, when we go through this physical experience. And so it's always guiding us. It's always secretly whispering to us. Some whispers are louder than others, depending on the circumstances, but it's always there kind of being that compass to lead us to the reason why we're here and what our purpose is um, during this lifetime. And so um, why I consider it to be so important is why would I, it's, it's almost like wanting to put the map away and being like, ah, oh, I'm just going to guess where this address that I'm going to, that might be across the world, or it might be across the other side of town. Um, but we have the map right now. Do we see the whole map? No. I always say, um, spirit is the most frustrating project manager I've ever come across because they don't give you the whole picture. <laughs> I can't help it. I have, you know, like I do love business. So I, I tend to kind of uh, relate it back. Um, but you only see a little crumb. You only see a tiny little speck of the next step directly in front of you. And it can be really frustrating because we think we're going to, in this address and, and, you know, spirits directing us to this other address. And so it, it can be very frustrating when you only see that little step in front of you, right? Um, but I really believe that not only is it something that leads us to our purpose, but it is a pillar of our mental wellness as a counselor um, and understanding that and a mental uh, wellness advocate. For me, it's very important that we understand that spirit and mental wellness are not two separate things. Our mental health and spirit are intrinsically combined. And if we cannot create a life where we trust ourselves, where we trust that little voice inside that's guiding us, if we don't have that, then I I can't, we can't have mental health. We can't have mental wellness because they're they're intrinsically connected, right? Imagine you live a life where you're constantly being told that that little gut instinct that you have is always wrong. Even if we don't know what that gut instinct, wh where that's taking us or what the purpose is, but constantly being told how your feeling is wrong when you are the expert of your own life, that is very, very damaging. And so for me, um, spirituality isn't this abstract thing that, um, we kind of close our eyes and separate away from this world in order to connect and be part of. I think that it is something that we need to bring into the physical on a daily basis. We need to make space in our life um, to be able to hold that wisdom. And it doesn't mean that you throw away all the other principles and guidance and learning that we have, right? As a social worker, I have, I have training, but I marry the two right? Because it's very important that that voice within um, really is what guides us. Because at the end of the day, it just never steered me wrong. I'm really curious because um, in my experience, I absolutely agree with you that, uh, you know, mental wellness and spirituality is intertwined. It, it is, you know, you have to have one in order to be well in the other. And um, in my experience, some people aren't ready to open up into their intuition or lean into their intuition. They're not ready. They're a little bit more of like the logical mind. They're very black and white. They're very of this world, right? Like they're, they don't, they, maybe they don't believe in God or, or believe in, in their inner voice or instance, that's just not how they're programmed. So what are some ways of allowing them to kind of come back into that and kind of experiment with leaning into that intuition so that it brings them more of that mental wellness? That's a fantastic question. 
So one, and, and I think I lead with this one because I think it's so important. Everybody comes at this at their own time. We are, our job is not to evangelize. Our job is not to convert anyone. Our job is not to convince, right? Our job is to live in our truth. And what I see when you start to live that and you live the magic that comes with that, because it, it really does feel like magic, people notice and you're living by example there, right? You're really walking your talk and walking this talk is not easy because when I listen to my intuition, that's great. But I also have to honor the fact that you have to listen to your own and your intuition might not match mine. Right. And that, that really can be challenging for people. But one is uh, going back to the question. One is letting people come at this at their own time. The universe is fantastic at creating scenarios that push people and push people and almost corner them. As I see at certain points in life where they're kind of like, the surrender has to happen and it comes out of their own wanting to not of anyone else convincing them. Um, and then you get these people that never listen and they're, and I'm like, okay, if you choose, if, if everything else is not working and these odd instances are happening in your life and you can't make sense of them and you choose not to open your mind to the possibility that there might be another answer out there. And you just kind of really dig your heels in into this way. That's fine. There's nothing that can be done there, right? It really is a process that is so unique and individual. And I think the other thing that I'd like to mention with that, because I have a friend currently going through that and, and I've gone through, gone through it this year as well, is we have multiple spiritual awakenings. We always think that we have one. And the first one always seems to be the most uncomfortable and our lives are flipped upside down. And you can read and, and see lots of content out there. People being like, oh my God, this, you know, it's a mess. I'm on a, you know, it's like being in the middle of a tornado and sure. But that happens as you progress. And if you stay with this path long enough, you'll realize that that happens multiple times in multiple different ways. Right. And so we might think, oh, I'm on a spiritual path and they're not too bad for them. And you're, you're like, oh, okay, honey, your your practice or your or your beliefs or how you experience this, it's about to up level. And your life is going to be turned upside down again as you kind of welcome in these new awarenesses and these new energies. So I look at it like I just have a lot of patience for people like that. And I honor where they're at. And for me, living a grounded life led by spirit is really recognizing that we live in this world. And so my job is to be as relatable as possible to the people on this world, in this world, right? So, you know, I remember when I first started, I stopped watching the news, I watch regular movies, I would hermit myself away, you know, the, and and that was great as long as, as I was with like-minded people, but I still had to function in the world. And I still had a regular job at that time. And so I, it, the world became almost much more difficult because of that. It was more difficult than me not cloistering myself away. Right. And so it's, it's so much about balance. Oh my gosh. Oh, yes. Um, I can relate so much to that. I still don't watch the news. I get a lot of my news from my husband. Um, but yeah, I stopped watching movies and regular TV probably like a decade ago. And I was left out of every conversation at work with my friends. Like, and for me, it was fine. Um, but then after a while, it's like, all right, I need to start reintegrating and being relatable. So I love that you voice that because it's such a real um thing that happens when we're spiritually awakening, like, okay, I really want to be in touch with this. And you tend to spend a lot of your time meditating and being in nature and reading a lot of books you've never really been exposed to that you kind of forget how to have this, like, be in, in, in social settings and, and things like that. Um, so what a, what a great segue. <laughs> And a really, you know, a, a traditional premise of spiritual kind of enlightenment or walking that journey is, is being in service, 
yeah. right? Being there for others, whether it's helping them through their own awakening when they ask for help, right? Or, you know, whatever your gifts are. So how can you be in service if you're not in part of that conversation? Right? Yeah, it's so true. Um, as a Latina in business, what are some unique perspectives that you bring to your work? And um, have there been any challenges that you have faced? That's, <laughs> I love that you asked that. Um, so it's interesting because physically, if you look at me, I pass very easily, right? Um, unless you saw my name um, here in Canada, people kind of assume something else that I'm not, that I'm not Latina. But I would say definitely um, for many years, I, I kind of wore this mask in business, right? Mm -hmm. Very much like, you know, you got to be serious and, you know, you don't talk about certain topics and you dress a certain way. And my soul was dying. I was the, I was the murderer of my own soul in making those decisions. And so for me, um, when I really embraced this again, because I, I had to take some time off for some personal stuff, but when I really embraced this again, um, it was my spirits actually. Cause I was going to pick some like non curandera name. Let's put it that way. Right. My spirits are like, no, this is what you are. And I was like, people aren't going to understand that here. Right. Like I think, um, in the States where there's a lot more Latin immigration and you're closer to Mexico, Mm -hmm. that leads over right and so that might not be a new concept here I'm I'm a pioneer in kind of bringing that forward and you know the name that I always get is or sorry the question that I always get is what does curandera mean right so like yeah. I, I wrote a whole blog post and the definition is part of my marketing right off the bat when you visit my website or if I'm doing a show or something but to me really um I found that uh I brush up against, sure, people that don't understand it, they're, they're scared of it, right? Because the reality is, is that, um, you know, when we enter the spiritual space, I call it like a big theme park, okay? And when you enter the theme park, there's a lot of different players in the spiritual space. There's the new age, love and light. There is the occult studies. There are, and there's kind of, you know, some darker stuff, some people that are like, no, darker stuff doesn't exist. And so they're like turning their back to the reality of these other players in that space and the energies that are that are at work and, you know, the misrepresentation of a lot of energies, right? So you, I get a lot of people that might be in that new age space that when they feel a land spirit, for example, they're freaked out. That's dark. And I was like, is it? Or is it just a, a different letter in the alphabet that you've never met that makes up your reality and that is still influencing you in different ways, right? And so I think as a practitioner, I'm unique, at least in the area that I'm in, that I that I carry both of those in, in kind of getting the understanding that just like the forces of nature, there's a lot of different things at play. And it's really about kind of balancing that when we look at our, ourselves and our own bodies and you know, our health and well-being. And that's been a challenge, to be honest with you. Um, and I, you know, I jokingly tell people, um, I tend not to go about, my rule is I'll go about an hour and 15 minutes outside of the area that I'm in, because I'm in the greater Toronto area, multicultural as can be, like we're the United Nations here. You don't blink an eye when you see somebody of a different, that looks different than you or is dressing different, you know, to hear in this region, you know, people that don't try other people's food are are shunned. They're like looked at ridiculous. Like, what do you mean? Like, how can you be so close minded? But that's because I'm in a in a heavily populated multicultural region. You start to go to the outskirts of that, and I absolutely felt the shift in how people reacted to me when I was doing these fairs and shows. And so I started creating a rule. I'm like, yeah, I'm not. You know, there are just towns that I don't. I don't walk into anymore because from a business perspective, it's not worth it from the question, the responses that I get from questions that people um, ask me and, and I tell them. So for example, um, something that's very common and it's 
Very common all over the world, I found out, not just to Latin America, are egg cleanses. And I do that in my shows. Uh, limpias. And that's the number. What's an egg cleanse? What do you need, right? The further I, I go, you know, you're at a spiritual fair. You're going to be exposed to a variety of different things and different traditions and different practices. Never would I consider laughing at somebody when they were explaining their practice. Yet that is something very, well, that's ridiculous. Why would you ever do that? Oh my God. <laughs> you know, and, and so what I started to realize is, is um, not everybody's as open-minded, right? And so I, get, I think it depends on the mood. And if my spirits are like, you need to go here. And I'm like, I really don't want to go there. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I don't want to go out of my comfort zone, but you know, that happens. So it's, it's been definitely an experience, but what I have noticed is since turning 40, I've very much embraced where I come from, what my traditions are, how my spirits show up, because my spirits have taught me every single thing that I do now with clients, aside from my training in school. And they have held me up. They have put up with me when I didn't want to deal with them anymore. And it really is an honor to them um, in regards to, to how I'm showing up with my latina -ness, let's put it that way. Um, and it's, and it's like, I've just felt so much more comfortable, but you know, the reality is, is that, um, not everybody feels comfortable around that, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in, in, in the spiritual community, because we have kind of a particular way that, you know, is, is very popular. And, and I've been in this community for a really long time, even though I took a break. And it wasn't as commercialized when I started. Now, everybody and their mother is doing this. And that's great on one aspect, but on the other, not everybody's meant to work with the public. Just because you have gifts doesn't mean you're meant to work with the public. Um, and yes, these gifts are special and you're meant to work with people, but you want to make your gifts accessible. Right. If you're saving up six months to see somebody, right, is that is that really accessible? Right. I see some people now like twelve hundred dollars a session. I'm like, what? But that's just how how are you in service? Now you have to eat, you know, I'm a business person. I need to make money at the end of the day, right? This is my livelihood. But I think that we it's almost like the pendulum has swung very much one way. Um it's swinging back the other way now. We kind of need it to come back to center. I love that you bring this up because, well, first, let me just acknowledge everything you just said as a Latina woman. I think a lot of us can relate to that. And, you know, I love Toronto. I, I've been there, but I've also been to the outskirts of it. So I can totally relate to that. And I think even here in the United States, <laughs> yeah, I'm from California and, and all, a lot of this stuff is very well accepted. And I feel like I'm with my people and, and things like that. But the minute you start to go Midwest, more center of America, it, you could feel the energy shift. And so I think a lot of us can definitely relate to that, but I also want to touch on, because you said everyone and their mom is, is now practicing this. And when I first started on this journey, I couldn't find a teacher that looked or spoke like me, right? My parents are, are from Panama. I have ancestors from all over Latin America. Yo soy mestiza, right? Um, so I have grandparents from China, grandparents from, from Greece. I have great grandparents from Mexico, Peru, Venezuela. Like I'm just a mix, right? But I, oh, for the wow. life of me, I could yeah. not find every single uh, spiritual leader was a white woman, blonde, blue eye, like, <laughs> and I had finally found this, this woman that really taught with her heart, right? But again, she didn't look or sound like me. And she was actually taking indigenous practices from Colombia, from Brazil, and, but she was clearly anglo european descent what are your thoughts around that because i have me personally i have a very mixed feelings about it because i'm so grateful to her 
for the path that she has shown shown and that's actually opened doors to teachers that look and sound like me and that are from from Central America and whatnot but I started off with her so I'm super grateful but at the same time I feel like there's so much appropriation and almost like she has stolen a lot of the knowledge that she learned down there and is now monetizing it and not just monetizing it in the way that you just explained to pay the bills, like her school was like 20 grand a year. Um, And it was just, and it's, it's just shocking, right? Like, and what you got wasn't necessarily worth that. And so just kind of looking for your perspective around that. I would say I'm conflicted as well myself. I have a, a huge mix in my ancestry. Um, and I might hear these complaints from people uh, because West African practices play a huge role in how I show up and and um, uh, kind of the practices that don't aren't necessarily leading, but make up a huge amount. Um, even though you would physically look at me, you would think I don't have, but I have quite a bit of West Africa, like when I did my ancestry. Um, same with the, the indigenous side. Um, so... I get a bit of what you're sharing. Um, I would say a couple of things. I don't think spirit discriminates in, and not discriminates, but I don't think spirit picks who they pick for whatever reason, right? So if you're called to those practices, go for it. I get it. I understand. Because when you have that calling, and I see it come up in people's readings all the time, right? Um, You know, it might be past life related. It might be an ancient ancestor, who knows, right? Like I said, it's the most frustrating project manager. They have their reasons. But I would say definitely a couple of things that come into play. I have a lot of problems when practitioners like that do not acknowledge where they came from, do not acknowledge and give credit to how did they learn this? Are they teaching the complete part of it? Um, And, and, recognizing that they might not be the physical kind of carriers of that wisdom. It is something that they have found great insight from, you know, has moved them to do that. I think also um, the monetizing, like <laughs> it it really shocks me as you kind of were to look at certain hashtags and on um, Instagram, Like it's, it's so much aesthetic and not the wisdom. And that, like, I just, to me, that breaks my heart because it's not how spirit is, right? If you genuinely, and I think I'm genuinely connecting to spirit. So that might be my own delusion. And there's probably somebody out there saying, maybe not, that's fine. We can agree to disagree. But what I have recognized and known in all of the people that I've helped over 20 years and in the thousands of readings that I've done and in the healings and all that stuff is it's not really that component that spirit leads with. Is it times where it's necessary? Aesthetics? Absolutely. Right. But you, I see it all the time where, you know, the readings that I give like I mentioned at the beginning, there's a huge healing component. So if you come for a reading from me, it's not going to tell you it might, but the focus really isn't going to be on what's the next color of car that you're going to buy. And, you know, it's, it's not, should I get bangs? You know, like it's, it's not really like that. It's very much like there's a trauma that happened to you when you were seven years old, that is still having ripple effects that are affecting how you move forward in life. Cause you've come to me because you're stuck in this part. Well, this is the formula. It started here. These are the practitioners or these are the types of healings or um, things that will bring you awareness that will help shift that. This is the part of the body that it's stuck in. This is what you got to do move forward. Right. And I see a lot of people that um, that come to these shows, they're kind of, they might be wearing the bindi, <laughs> that it's not part of their culture. You know, they might have tattoos of sigils up the yin yang. They're wearing their I love astrology shirt and, you know, like my tarot reading dogs mug, like they have all that stuff and they're like, I love it. And then when you get into the actual 
nitty gritty shadow work. Let's unearth some of this stuff that you've buried because it's, it's really integral to move forward. Mm -mm. Step away. No, I'm not interested in that. That sounds like a bad idea. That's messy. Uh, I'm not really prepared to do that. And that's fine. I recognize some people need a bit of time to kind of sit with it and really be like, you know, mentally prep yourself for kind of exploring this again. You might have done a lot of work to bury it down. Um, but it really is intrinsic to moving forward. And I think that a lot of the com com commercialization of spirituality does not recognize the need for you to do that own work, right? Um, I always talk about this in everybody should go to therapy, even for a little bit, even for a little bit. I don't believe in that you should be in therapy for five, 10, 15 years. That's not what I'm saying. But the introspection and the self dialogue and the, the starting to look at yourself from a different way that traditional therapy can provide for a little bit is very important so that you don't suffer from the delusionary ego of not doing that work that spirituality can create in your life. And then go and explore all the modalities and go and explore all that. But that foundation is really, really important because you see this all the time where spirit's telling me that I have to teach these people this. And it might be their family members. I got to teach them how to treat somebody, right? And it's like, do you? Really? Is is that what it is? Or does that really serve kind of the 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 what you've built yourself up to think you are? Right? Or does it come from a place of very much like, well, I've been enlightened and you are, and so you would never understand, right? Like there's there's a lot of this out there now that, you know, I think everybody eventually hopefully we'll come to to the meat and potatoes of of understanding what this work really is but it also leads to why so many people shouldn't be doing this work that are i think that you're speaking directly to my heart because that's something that i always say as well like um therapy is such a great tool um to have because to be able to reflect and unburden yourself right? Like the platicas that we do is there, there is magic in that there is healing in that. And to be able to do it where somebody is witnessing us in, in a way that they're not a part of our lives and they have a different perspective to offer. There's just so much um, magic in that. Now, obviously I think um, it's a lot of work to find the right therapist and the right person that um, can understand what we're saying um, but nonetheless, I think that it is, um, it is worth it. The shop around. Everybody thinks that what, just because you've been introduced to one therapist, that's who you have to go with. People shop around more they do for shoes than they do for picking a therapist. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I read somewhere that you started your first business at 12. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and how has your uh, business spirit evolved over the years and, you know, how have you been able to integrate your spiritual gifts into that? I love your question. I love that you've done your research. Thank you. <laughs> so yes, I inadvertently, inadvertently stumbled upon starting my own business when I was 12, just kind of like I stumbled upon my gifts. I've been more um, blind than I have been not blind in kind of where I'm going in life. Um, and I can laugh about it now. It was very frustrating when I was going through that. But so, yeah, so I started my first business when I was 12. I started um, taking kids back and forth to school. Uh, p mothers would pay me because we'd kind of live in the same area. And so at one point I had, I had like five. It was like it was all these gaggle of children that followed me. And and. I never would have considered myself entrepreneurial. Uh, am I going to run a business one? Absolutely not. You, I would have laughed at you if you ever told me that in my younger years. And then I started another business when I was 16, um, selling chocolates to, <laughs> to students in my house. I was known as the chocolate girl and people would be like, Hey, I hear you. Here's 25 cents here. And, you know, and I, and so, and that was just because I need, I wanted a dress to go to a prom and I couldn't afford it. So it was always kind of need driven. 
um, in that way. And so when I started my first real business was when um, uh, I had become a hypnotist and I was in that course with that medium that told me, oh, you should do this. And, you know, it kind of evolved like that. And I loved it. I was crappy at business, absolutely crappy at business because I just wanted to sit there and talk to people. Right. And, and, you know, no one ever tells you that running a business is really, it's, that's only about 30 to 40% of what you do. 60% is all the other stuff, administration, operations, marketing, all that, maybe not so fun stuff for certain people. And so that business went bankrupt um, in 2012 because there was a change in the legislation in the province that I live in, because I had certain services covered under insurance, that changed, and then they weren't. So I went from um, eight to 10 new clients a month through my hypnosis business to four in a year. And I absolutely had not diversified, um, created alternative streams of revenue, or really even considered, you know, what that might change or kind of been paying attention. It just kind of hit me. And so what happened was, was I went back to school to get my master's in social work and I needed to do something to bring in money. And I was like, I'm too old to want to stand at Old Navy and fold shirts all day. Not that, not that there's anything wrong with that. I just didn't think I had the stamina for it. And so I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? And so I, I've always been great with technology. And so I created a little tech business on the side, helping entrepreneurs that didn't know much about technology, set up their printers, create some um, use of some software, things of that nature. And that business grew. But what that business, when, as that business grew, it gave me the opportunity to see behind the scenes of all these other businesses, because I thought everybody in business understands what they're doing, except me at kind of the same attitude that I had when I started counseling. I'm like, I'm the only screwed up person in the world. Everybody seems to have it together. And I, you know, and that opened up to the reality of like, that's not the case. Same in business. Most people don't know what they're doing in all reality, right? Like it, we're, we're scrambling, we're learning on the fly. It's part of why it's so high stress. And so I was like, whoa, okay. And I really took it on to myself to learn as much about business as I could through these other businesses. And so it really gave me an understanding um, of how to do things better. And so when spirit called me again to this work, which I had left kicking and screaming <laughs> um, because I, I was just going through some stuff um, and I was able to get going again, it was like magic for me because not only did I have my gifts, but these all these years that I had learned from businesses, I was able to combine that. And all of a sudden it wasn't so hard, right? So it's it's been definitely a journey. And I would say since COVID, it's really where I've pivoted to having um, a spirit-led business, right? Taking all that wisdom but really following my intuition, right? And, and it takes a lot of trust to do that because spirit is not a business manager and spirit's not look, looking to line your pockets 24 seven. They want you to eat, don't get me wrong, but they're going to make you make moves that you're like, this goes against every single sound uh, principle there is out there for running a business. But those are the gambles that pay off so well later because everybody's like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? You're Because you're swimming against the current that everyone else is going in. But then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow. Right. And so you really start to lean into that more and more. Right. And, and understanding um, how spirit works with you individually in regards to your seasons. There are seasons where you might be creating lots. And then there's others where you're like, you need to relax. Right. Um, you know, one of the things for me, I'm never going to be a reader that reads uh, five days a week, eight hours a day for the entire month. Spirit's like, you absolutely cannot do that. Um, you need to recover you. And even though it doesn't tire me out, but they're like, you, we require a balance here. So like, I only read two months, two weeks out of the month. 
right? So what do I do? I have to create alternative sources of uh, income streams to compensate for that. And so I have a product line and, you know, there's a variety of different things that I do. But again, when you when you lead your, your business by spirit, everyone's going to think you're nuts. If you go the traditional wisdom of getting a coach or a coach that doesn't understand that, they're going to be like, you're crazy. What are you doing? <laughs> why? Why? Don't do this to yourself. Oh my God, Carolina. Like, I feel like these are all messages I needed to hear because I absolutely run my business that way. And I have a nine to five because that's what feeds me. And also it grounds me in reality and it helps me, you know, be in the 3D world and help people that are are in similar jobs. But that's exactly how I run my business. There are times where it's like, nope, don't do anything. And I'm like, but I have to pay rent because my whole thing is like, I'm not going to pay for the business out of pocket. And the business need to, needs to pay for itself, not necessarily for me to make money off the business, but it, it, it needs to sustain itself. And that's what I ask for spirit, but- Absolutely, no, no. You should, otherwise it's an expensive hobby, yeah, right? <laughs> totally, totally. And, you know- Sometimes I sit back and I think like, is this even like realistic? But everything you just said is exactly how I run it. Like there are months where her spirit is like, nope, you just need to rest. And it, somehow I, I make rent um, and I'm like, wow, thank you, spirit. Uh, and then there are other months where it's like, okay, go, go, go. Like last year, I thought in December I was just going to rest and spirit was like, nope, you're going to make candles and you're going to market this and you're going to market that. And I'm like, all right. And I was able to make rent that way. And it's just, it's fascinating. And I love that you said also voiced that you only do readings twice, uh, two weeks out of the month, because sometimes I'm like, okay, well, do I need to up my Reiki offerings for more? And the answer is always no. So this is, this conversation is very comforting to me. <laughs> Well, listen, if what's the point, like really what's the point if we are taking that hustle mentality into something that is not hustle, right? And, and if you really are fed and it sounds like you're fed really by, by the work that you do, what's, I don't want to be exhausted by the end. Of, like, I don't know. I just think there's different, that's why I call business enlightened. Like there's different ways to do business that aren't 100% profit driven but that do make you money. You might not be, you know, doubling your profits every year. That's okay, right? And I think we need to acknowledge that that's okay, that we're not willing to give every, every ounce of life force just for a dollar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, a hoe, absolutely. I'm wondering, uh, why would somebody come to see you? And can you tell us a little bit about your process of guiding clients? Um, in finding their meaning and purpose. Sure. Awesome. So um, first off, you start off, um, I offer a free 10 minute consultation um, for a couple of reasons. One realistically is because I can't read everyone and not every medium will be honest about that. There are people that sit in front of me. That's where it's like, no, no. <laughs> End of story. I don't get a reason for it. Um, out of, you know, deduction from it happening, the amount of times it's happened, there's a few different reasons. Sometimes it's for my own safety. Um, you know, there are people, you know, uh, I'll put it out there right now. I believe in evil. There are bad, evil things out there, right? A lot of people don't. But first of all, you got to be somebody that understands that there are good and bad forces in the world to want to work with me because that's just my worldview. Number two, um, sometimes people come in carrying a lot of things, right? And so, especially if I'm at a show, it's a kind of a bit of a different setup. There are people that it's weird to be like, no, sorry, you, you, you are not reading this person today. So I offer that free 10 minute consultation so that I can see if, if spirit says yes or no, because I don't offer a refund. So I always encourage people to say, Hey, talk to me, find out if you even like me. Because I'm not, I'm not the person to work with for every person. There are people that absolutely I turn their stomach. I know that. And I'm fine with that. But 
I want you to know that before you invest. So I give you an opportunity for you to kind of ask your questions where it's not psychic related, but it's more process related. Um, and then from that, I, I'll recommend a divination, a reading, because in that reading, we're going to figure out what is the stuff that spirit thinks that is important. Because a lot of people come to me be like, I want to work on this. And I'm like, okay, well, let's see what the reading says, because my readings start off with having spirit say whatever it is, messages that they need to be brought forward. So you might be coming for love and spirits like, honey, you got to focus on your health. This is out of whack, right? And so people are kind of always kind of taken aback. So I prepare them for that. I'm like, I don't, I have no control as to what comes out first. And then once that's done, then we can open up to whatever area you want to bring questions to. But when, what I find is when, when people are in front of a true medium, spirits, spirit and spirits are lining up to speak to them because there might be things that they've been trying to get the message across to you that you haven't been listening. So that initial reading will give us a roadmap of kind of what's going on, what's holding you back, what are some of the areas that you need to focus on, and, um, you know, are you going in the direction that you think you're going? Because sometimes those readings pull the emergency brake on people, and they think they're going this way, and then they're like, they go the other way. Same reason why I say to people, write your questions down. Because if it's an emergency break reading, people are stunned and then they forget <laughs> the, the kind of the list of questions that they originally pushed them to book because they're like, I was not expecting this to go in this direction type of thing. Um, I believe, uh, again, going back to my worldview in regards to how I work, um, and if you've ever worked with a curandera, you know that there are energies that attach on that cause issues, right? So a lot of my work is clearing work. Actually, I'm always surprised how much my work is clearing work. I would say it's 50% at least, right? And it depends on the severity of what we're clearing. Some stuff blows off easily. Other stuff is more sticky, right? Um, also, we, I take into, we take, I say this as my spirits, we take this, we take ancestry genealogy into consideration when we're doing the work, because we might live in a melting pot. I live in Toronto, multicultural, everything. So the uniqueness of working in an area like this is because I see so many different spirits of so many different traditions, even though I'm working in mine and there is a, there is a commonality regardless of the spirit and the region it comes from, there's a commonality in kind of spirit work, but I get to see kind of different traditions and, you know, I'll get instructions when I'm working with someone in the morning before they come into their session. I'm like, why are you telling me to do that? That's really weird. Okay. And then the person comes in and I'll be like, I'm being guided to do this. And they're like, oh yeah, that's what they do back in my country. I remember my grandfather doing that. And I was like, oh, okay. Like I had one woman, she was from Taiwan, I think it was. And what we were getting rid of, I would have thrown in a kind of a bonfire in my backyard. I would have put it, I would have burnt kind of the herb that we were working with in some of the material. And my spirit said, she has to watch it. And I said, what? Why? I wouldn't do that. Like, why? And they're like, no, no, she has to be present for that. And I was like, okay. And, you know, it messes up my perfectly organized day and timeline and you know the project manager and me um it, it's 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 annoying let me put it that way but when I when I brought her and she goes oh yeah my grandfather when we would have a spirit removed from the house or when somebody was doing this um we'd all have to go around the fire and watch it go and pray that our ancestors were helping it would be removed from our life and I was like oh okay so I always feel like an ass after I question me <laughs> <laughs> with, with things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 I, I would say if you're looking for a very new age, very kind of etheric, non-grounded, um, non-traditional, I'm not the person for you. And that's completely okay. I can refer you to people. Um, if you like what I've said so far, but you think maybe working together isn't the right fit, that's fine. Not a problem. I don't take offense to that. Um, but I, I, I firmly believe that for the last 200 years, there's been a really big concerted effort 
of removing us from the great spiritual wisdom this, that we as a people on this planet carried and that our ancestors were so good at. And some of it has, we've been removed. Some of it has been corrupted or shifted or kind of infected. And so there's a lot of truth, but then there's a little bit of not so true stuff that kind of actually harms us. And so um, I've worked really hard. My partner, uh, my husband's involved in this stuff as well. Um, he's a Renaissance astrologer and he's also a medium. So sometimes we work together in cases, depending on the difficulty of who we're, um, who we're working with. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that we have so much for, to learn from our ancestors. Um, and really my ancestors are who have guided this journey for me. So I'm always kind of, that's my North. That's my true North oh. in any work that I do. That's beautiful. So I have two follow-up questions. Do you only see clients in person or is this something that you can do virtually? I can do virtually depending on the cases. They're very, very rare cases, like maybe 5% I'll have to see in person or I will recommend. My husband has a very vast network in the way that he works. So he can recommend legit practitioners in different areas if you have to see somebody in person. But um, there's a lot that can be done online, quite quite okay. a bit. Awesome. And so I met a lot of like spiritual women that are looking for spiritual men. Can you tell us a little bit about like when you met your husband, was he already on the spiritual path? Like, can you tell us a little bit of background on that? <laughs> and how did, how did that come about? It was spirit. So I, I, I'm sorry to burst your, I wish I could give you the formula. Um, I, we met the first time when we were eight and then we met again in a high school class when we were 18 and I hated his guts. I wanted nothing to do with him. That creepy voice that I didn't know what was saying, because I couldn't find a boyfriend at the time. Like, oh my God, I'm going to be single forever. Like, I remember sitting in the class saying that and spirit's like, he's right there. He's right there. That's your, that's, that's your future husband. Right now. And I literally, I was like, fuck off. Like, what are you saying? You know, like I was saying to myself, you're going, like, I really thought I was going crazy back then. And fast forward, I got married. I got divorced. <laughs> and um, we met at a meditation class. And I said, you look very familiar. He's like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, you don't really look familiar to me. And, I, and then I was like, and I'm somebody that I never forget a face. Names all the time, within two seconds. But faces and stories, I don't forget. And I was like, I know you, I know you. And I was like, oh my God, you were in my law class. And um, so it was absolutely like spirit brought us together. So I, I, I don't have many tips there. I apologize. <laughs> No, I, I'm just always curious because um, it always comes up and it's like, well, there's, there's no formula here. Like you just, uh, you know, you got to put your intention out there and, and ask spirit to guide you. And so it's always very fascinating when I hear two people that are together and are on the same path, because usually what happens is one person gets on that path. And something happens where it either separates them or it brings them closer together. And so it's always fascinating to hear. So it sounds like he was already on the path when you met him meeting in meditation class. He was probably consciously on the path longer than I've been. Mm. So he's been on the path since childhood, very consciously, like taking books at a library. Um, he, he has... He's very autistic in his, and he is in, especially in his research. So he's like, I'm like, you, you put all your autism juice into that research. And then when you're done, you tell me about it <laughs> because I'm like, yeah. I'm not going to put the level of time and effort that you're doing. But um, yeah, that started very, very early for him. Wow. That's incredible. I love it. Um, can you tell our audience where can they find you? How can they contact you? Um, do you have any events coming up? Yeah. Um, okay. So you can find me on curandera.ca, C-U-R-A-N-D-E-R-A.ca. Um, all my events are, uh, for the next little bit, are local here in the GTA. Um, but I offer monthly uh, something called a fireside chat. 
and it's one hour a month. It's completely free. And it's an opportunity for you to meet other like-minded individuals on the spiritual journey. And we'll pick one topic that we discuss as a group over Zoom. So that's something really easy. Um, I have I have a new series coming out in the fall called Walking with Your Ancestors. And it's all different little workshops about how you build that ancestral connection and what are some of the very real daily tangible things that you can do in order to strengthen that connection, even if you might not know your ancestry, even if I might, you know, like I'm, I'm currently working with somebody that was adopted and, and we're kind of navigating that. Um, so that's definitely in the works. And I'm also been, um, t- I've been told that the idea is coming. So I have to trust that spirit will have its time when it gives it to them. Um, but I want, I'm, I do on the side business coaching for spiritual businesses and how to kind of marry those two. And so I'm creating a program where you're kind of going through that and, and kind of recognizing some of the emotional instability that comes with entrepreneurship and how to work that along with your spiritual side so that you don't become a victim of your business. Mm. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. And I, I will I'll link all of those links down below so people can find you easily and connect. Thank you so much for everything that you bring into this world. It is so much needed. And thank you for sharing your wisdom here on Sacred Arts. Oh, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to meet and chat with you. It's always exciting to meet another Latina in this space. Of course. For all of our listeners, if you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe down below and also let us know what you thought of it in the comments. We'll see you next time.